We'll be going live in 10 minutes. This is the Stephen Pope Ask Me Any Amazon Question, weekly Fridays at noon.
Going live in two minutes today, we've got Josh Hadley talking about product launches. Ask your product launch questions in the comment section. to ask me any Amazon question going live in under one minute. Ask me a PPC question, SEO, design, catalog. It's my passion to help the Amazon community and I'm here to answer your questions. I'm the founder of My Amazon Guy with more than 300 employees worldwide serving your Amazon accounts. I'm also the owner of My Refund Guy, a clawback service, Mag School with courses under $20. And find your next virtual assistant at sellercentraljobs.com. Hello and welcome to the My Amazon Guy podcast. Today we've got a special guest with Josh Hadley. He's an expert on launching products, how to find ideas, sharing the tools he uses. So Josh, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks, Stephen. It's a pleasure to be here today. So if anybody has questions today around that starting point of getting a product off the ground, this is the guy to ask. He's got lots of ideas to share, uh, and we'll, we'll jump in and start with some of your questions here momentarily. Uh, but first, Josh, just so people know who you are and why you're an expert in some of the things we're going to talk about today, go ahead and give us a little bit of an intro. Yeah, so my name is Josh Hadley. I'm the owner of an eight-figure e-commerce brand, primarily selling here on Amazon. My wife and I have built this up um, over the last five years, specifically on Amazon, and we've launched over 1,300 products over those five years. So we've got a massive catalog of products, and one of the most important things that we focus on on a monthly basis is coming out with at least 40 new SKUs every single month for our business. So we're it's doing this on repeat. That is a lot of SKUs. Uh, Noma from LinkedIn says, hi, Steve, how are you doing? Uh, and I'm really excited to jump in. So just from a starting point, uh, Josh, tell us, you know, what are what's like the number one mistake people make uh, when they start to think about launching their next product? Yeah, I think one of the many mistakes that I made early on my journey is that, you know, you you use the Helium 10 tools, you go into Amazon, you've got the Helium 10 extension, you look at this product category, right? And you see that, oh, wow, look how look how many sales people are getting. And then what you end up trying to do is trying to create a me too product without bringing new ideas, without bringing ingenuity into that. And also not understanding, which is I think the most important part, the keyword research that sits behind that product. When we launched products to begin with, we had kind of a 50-50 you know, success rate. And the reason why we failed more often than not there was because we would fail on the keyword research. I would see somebody crushing it in a specific niche. I would go kind of recreate that product. But what I failed to do, and I then realized what was going on, was that I wasn't understanding where these people that were amassing a lot of sales were getting their traffic from. And it ended up being a lot of gift-related keywords or 
big broad related keywords such as like you know baby shower gift ideas or just baby shower ideas things like that that they were ranking on that i thought hey you know i, I kind of overlooked that and so today i want to walk through and, and share with the audience all of the tools that we have gathered and we have vetted this process i i now have a team that actually manages this process for me for me we've created a lot of sops around it and it's been refined time and time again and so we're very confident now when we're launching new products we know exactly what we're doing um we have a higher you know success rate with our product launches and so i hope to help a lot of people that are you know overcome a lot of those mistakes that i made early on in in my product selection journey and trying to launch new products on amazon all right. So just to summarize, uh, make sure you don't just make a me too products, right? You're not going to have uh, the ability to go to market with the same garlic presser, the same apple slicer as everybody else. You got to got to come to the table with something new, but make sure you do your keyword research so you can position the products. Uh, so when you show up, you're you're hitting those keywords and traffic makes makes sense. OK, so uh, let's let's dive into some of these tools. Uh, so, so, Josh, feel free to um, demo anything you'd like here and why people should be using these as part of their, their launch kit. Perfect. Sounds great. So I'm going to start off by first saying how important it is on Amazon to actually be building a brand, right? I think long gone are the days of just trying to find one single product opportunity on Amazon and just slapping some random brand name that you just came up with overnight and sending it out to the Amazon marketplace. Amazon is becoming much more mature and you can see that Amazon is leaning more into brands as well. Everything that they're coming out with, with you know the email campaigns, right? You can now access your, e your Amazon customers. You don't get their email addresses per se, but you can use Amazon's tools to reach out to them. You have the Amazon storefront, right? You have the follow button, you have Amazon posts. Amazon is trying to focus on branding with all of their sellers. And so if you want to stay relevant over the next five to 10 years in the e-commerce space, you've got to be focused on a brand. So as I begin, that's what I want to kind of start with is this premise of like, don't just look for any random product opportunity. And that was kind of one of the mistakes I made early on. It was like, I don't know. I just, I just want to make money. I got to find a new product that I want to launch. And instead what we've done as we've matured as a business is it is much more along the lines of like, how do we add to our existing product line? How does this make sense within the brand that we are building and hoping to exit someday? So to begin with, one of the first um, ideas or kind of tools that I, I would like to share with everybody is called the Market Basket Analysis Tool on Amazon. And this is if you have an existing brand, and I'll share my screen here in a minute. You have to be brand registered, right? Go through that process. And as soon as you, you know, have brand registry enabled on your account, then you can go into some of these tools. And these are the main tools I'll be talking about today. Brand analytics, you'll have the market basket analysis. This is one of my favorite tools, market basket analysis, especially if you want to build out your brand. Um, and Steven, I'm curious, I want to ask you a quick question actually, sure. as, as we dive in here. Um, I have heard, I had uh, another gentleman on my podcast recently, and he talked about how launching products on a regular basis is actually part of the A9 algorithm in some way. His hypothesis, and he said that he had seen it in the data for brands that are more consistently launching new products, it kind of gives a little bump even to some of those older products. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on the A9 algorithm favoring brands that are kind of consistently bringing new stuff to the platform? I, I don't I don't believe that in the way that it was described. I don't think it's you simply load more products and you you sell more on the account. But what I do think is there is an indirect link. Right. If the new product is successful, there is a halo effect. Hundred percent believe that right? yeah. if. If I have a new product under Age of Sage and all of a sudden it takes off, I'm going to increase my average order value. My A-plus content product grids are linking over to these products. Um, so I do believe that. I don't think that there is like literally code that says if brand launches 10% new products, increase traffic to their product page by 5%. I don't think that happens. 
Um, but just to just to kind of show like how I think the halo effect could work, I, I'll demo this real quick. So so here's here's a product, right? If I launch a six variation and the six variation gets number one new release in men's soap, I know that my other five products are going to benefit from that. I know sure. that if I parent a new product onto some of these, that it's going to help them out. I know that if I build a product uh, brand story like this, and I'm linking to all these products like this, that that AOV halo effect will occur because they're not just going to buy one product. They're going to come in here and they're going to click on more stuff. I know that if I have A plus content and I have a product grid and I'm showcasing all of these dis different products, that even if it's a, a new product and it sells 10 units a month, I'm probably going to occasionally see some halo effect push over to these additional products. But I, I'm, I would say hard pressed to believe the A9 is directly programmed, but I do believe the indirect benefit would 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 allow that halo effect yeah yeah and, and i do agree with you in terms of you know that halo effect definitely exists and to be honest with you as we look at our brand and as we've continued to launch products time and time again one of the biggest growth levers in our business is continuing to launch new products so there's, I would there's no doubt in my mind everybody needs to continue to launch products if you're yeah. not launching products eventually your 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 mainstay product will dwindle there's no question about that Exactly. Uh, so so we, we've got a stack of questions here, but I, I want to give Josh a, a, a chance to demo some of these tool stacks because I think that'll create additional questions yep. as well. Um, so let me, yeah, let me, let, let me kind of dive into those then real quick. And then, uh, then I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So yeah, people yeah. want to talk about how to fix old products, launching new ones. How, uh, C asks, how do you market your customers? So we do have a video on email marketing your customers. It's kind of low key. Um, all right, so let's dive in. So here's the brand analytics tool. Uh, this is one of the coolest things Amazon released in the last few years is giving you more data. Yeah. So why should people be looking at the market basket analysis? Yeah, market basket analysis is super important, especially if you are trying to build out a brand. So I think everybody knows that on the on the Amazon detail page for your product, right? There's the section that says, hey, frequently purchased together section, right? Well, rather than you having to manually comb through all of your listings, if you have a large catalog like we do, and having to actually document things down and what are the ASINs, et cetera, you could do that manually. But what you will not get is how like the actual like frequency purchase rate um, that Amazon is giving you. So basically what the market basket analysis does is here's our, you know, we have 1,400, 1,444 ASINs loaded up in here, right? In this market basket analysis. For every single one of my ASINs, Amazon is telling me, here is the most frequently purchased together product with each ASIN. So so what I'm seeing on screen is a little blurry. Um, it's only like the lines of data in there, not I'm, the actual- I'm showing, yeah, so I, I blurred out, I blurred out the rest of our perfect. catalog, but okay. I'm showing you the top, the top line here. Okay, got it, got it, got it, okay. Yep. So if you look at this top one, right? So we have an edge, like a classroom, we have a classroom poster, set of six classroom posters, right? What Amazon is telling me is that one of the most per frequently purchased products with our set of classroom posters is this bulletin board border, okay? So this is just kind of like a little, like it's literally like three inches, wide and then it goes you know i think it's like 20 feet long or something like that it's borders to go around an actual bulletin board right so as we look at building out new product lines that is one of the first things that we do again i have a team that goes through here and we are getting new product ideas you can change this on like a quarterly a monthly a weekly basis this was just a screenshot that i grabbed um but you can change that and on a weekly basis you could see how things change um, especially at different times of the year you will see things change right for seasonality and so for us what this tells me is like holy smokes 35 percent of the time people are purchasing additional products with mine it's this product that's going with it so if i want to create a new product right that fits within our brand one of the best things to do is come over here and you can actually filter by like, what's the number one like percentage product, right? And so 35%, very high. This is on our, our product roadmap, right? And so we found this product idea and I and we go through every single one of our ASINs to find like, 
what else are people buying with this? And so that that's probably one of the easiest low hanging fruits is like Amazon's telling you exactly what people are buying with your items. If you want to build out a brand, here's your next product ideas. Does that make sense, Steven? Makes perfect sense. All right. So this is an easy tip, easy to replicate and go right into the brand analytics. Yep. Let's go into, let's come over here into Amazon. The next idea that I have here for you, if you're trying to build out your brand is go find your competitors. Okay. So let's say we're, we're in the cutting board niche, right? But we have designed cutting boards, right? We're not just selling generic cutting boards. We have designed, um, uh, cutting boards. So I'm going to do wedding cutting boards. All right. So that's going to be our, uh, kind of case study product today is these wedding or just kind of cutting boards in general, but I want to find one like this one. Okay. And they lived happily ever after this is not personalized. You can ship this in, you know, you could mass produce this product. All right. So if I want to look at this, I can come over here and I can go into this section here on your desktop, right? Sold by, you could also see this on the mobile app as well, but click who it's sold by, right? It's gonna be shipped yeah, from is, Amazon. This is public data, public Amazon data. Yep, not no black hat tactics, right? And then all you have to do, okay, we can see this is a Chinese competitor, okay? Come down here where it says, see all products currently offered by the seller. Boom, look at this. Now I've got even more product ideas. So let's say I started out and I was offering wedding cutting boards. Now I come here and I'm like, all right, the beautiful thing about this, and this is probably one of my favorite hacks, Amazon is showing every single brand's product list just like this in order of sales, right? So this is going not just some random order of their SKUs and I have no idea how many they're selling, no, like this is in order of like the most popular product. So it looks like they're doing well with this, you know, bag, right? This makeup bag. And then down here, oh, hey, if I'm in the cutting board niche, hey, it looks like this new homeowner, like housewarming gift could be a new idea. So this is the way you can kind of go through I think there's a bunch of people pulling here. up a second tab right now, trying to look at their own stores to see if the data is accurate. Right. Like, uh, does Amazon really ranking my stuff by best seller <laughs> like this? Like, uh, there's just a couple of skeptical people right now running under business reports. So yep. how do you know this is accurate, Josh? I've looked at it from not only our own products. And is it like uh, accurate on an hourly basis? I, I wouldn't argue that it's a done on an hourly basis. But in an aggregate, definitely like maybe it's over monthly sales or something like that. From what I've seen. You go check out a competitor's listings and you can even run Helium 10. I deactivated the Helium 10 um, uh, Chrome extension here for this podcast because I didn't want to slow down the computer. But you could pull up the Helium 10 extension and you could then Validate. analyze the sales results, right? The yep. BSRs. So. Yeah, so I, so I just audited mine and I would say it's directionally accurate. And, and so like my top four sellers are in the top five or six positions. Yeah. So, so that that's a great tip we just received, guys. This is something that I don't think I've talked about on my podcast before. So this is new information to our network here is looking at competitors. Um, and this is not the brand store. This is the seller store. Yep. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, this, this is this is like a, a legacy store, right? Like this, the seller stores have always existed. This has been around since the beginning of Amazon's time, as long as I've been doing it. Uh, but it's not something that a lot of people are checking out or clicking on these days. So this is a lost art. And Josh just gave us a solid reason why to go check this out. All right. So this is this is tip number two. Great tip. Yep. All right. Nuggets, let's do as Brian says. Love it. <laughs> good. Always, always happy to share some, some good nuggets. Jack says, go on. Let's see some more. All right. All right. So my next uh, third tip will Time be... Time to check out my competitors. All right. Third tip. Go ahead. <laughs> All these comments. I like this. Getting some good momentum. I need to add this to my own podcast. It's good to have like some some people in the background listening, providing real-time feedback. All right. So third C tip. says bombs. <laughs> Steven, you're not going to let me keep going here. <laughs> All right. So number three is reaching out to your manufacturer. Okay. We did this recently with one of our manufacturers and we said, hey, send us samples of 
everything that you guys have ever worked on for any of your clients. Okay. And then we got this huge old box from them, right? Just filled with a lot of different stuff. They were and like, yes, me, please let me send you my junk. Yeah. For me, that was like my eyes lit up because I was like, OMG, I had no idea that you did, you know, I, wire binding, you know, hardcover books or something like that. Or, hey, I had no idea you guys did stickers. And so it opened up kind of the floodgates for me to be like, wow, I had no idea you guys do that. And now all of a sudden, when I'm looking for new product opportunities, you know, I think that's also one of the challenges that I've seen the most as we've kind of looked at getting into new product, op um, new product categories is like the biggest lift is obviously finding a manufacturer that you're going to be able to work with, that you can trust, that you could get fair pricing and terms with, all of that, right? Well, the more business you can bring to your manufacturer, and then this is kind of getting into a, a, a cash flow type of hack and just kind of a good negotiation skills, right? The more business you can bring one manufacturer, the more you know negotiation power you'll have in your corner, so to speak, right? because you'll have a larger book of business with them. And then one of the things that you could really focus on. What, what do you I, mean? I shouldn't just argue with some dude off Alibaba about lowering the MOQ from 1000 down to 500. No, this, this is much more like create, you've created this relationship, right? And once you've established this relationship, like the way that your manufacturer can help you is like, I love to see our manufacturers as partners of our business, right? With one of our manufacturers, we have net 90 day terms on them. We don't pay them anything. There's no deposit up front. There's nothing. We pay them 90 days after the product is shipped. Imagine what that does to your, your business Cash on flow. Amazon, right? All of a sudden, I'm launching a new product, making money on that product before I have even paid for that product, right? So, cash flow is like one of the biggest obstacles for any physical product brand. Right. And so working with the manufacturer. So that's why I think like this third tip is it helps you in so many aspects of your business and it allows you to just keep working with your existing manufacturer instead of having, wow, I have 10 different product ideas and now I have to go find 10 different manufacturers. That gets really challenging, really complex, real quick. So, so, so if we if we call this the product launching funnel and I'm spinning this off the top of my head, yep. but but most people are going from one direction and then going through the funnel. And what Josh just mentioned is go the opposite way. Instead of trying to come up with the idea and then find the manufacturer, find the manufacturer, then come up with the idea, do the exact opposite. And the cost savings outweigh some of the marketing. This is very similar to some of the techniques I talk about uh, frequently where I say, stick to what you know, right? Instead of just chasing data, um, almost like the dog chasing its tail. Yep. But when you stick to who you know, instead of just what you know, it's sometimes who, not how, just like the business book in terms <laughs> of getting your next product launch. Yep. So, so true. That, was, that was, that was, that was deep. All right. All right. So we got, we got some questions stacked up. So we're going to okay. mingle some of those in now and then right. uh, you can keep dropping some juicy tips. So check rec says, interesting. Premier auto says, ha ha. So true. Uh, Insham says, any tips for finding manufacturers on Alibaba? I would I would lean to you, Stephen, on that one. We do all of our manufacturing here in the U.S., so we do not reach out to anybody on Alibaba. So, sorry, no experience there. So, I, I hate sourcing. That is something I avoid like the plague. I have my business partner do it. This is why I bring people on like Norm Farrar, who's a sourcing guy. So, I'm going to, I'll sidestep the question too. Uh, but I will say this, uh, using Alibaba has increasingly been more difficult uh, just due to the amount of people using it. So the, the Chinese manufacturers, they just don't, they don't believe in us as much because there's so many of us that are haggling over MOQs instead of haggling over shipping 50,000 units. And so it's become problematic. Uh, we do, we do have some uh, uh, made in America Fans, so Brian's saying USA, USA, and and <laughs> and for years I've been talking about bringing manufacturing back to the states. I joined the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance. I've lived it. I actually manufacture holsters in the Carolinas myself. So like I'm I'm with you on the make stuff in the U.S. 
Uh, Success to Selling wants to know what manufacturers do you use in the U.S. So, so Josh, just just reveal your entire business plan to us, right? Real quick. Yeah, let let me just rattle it all off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but but what what would what would you tell them to do though to try and find some some U.S. based manufacturers? Because I'll be honest, it's not easy. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think the most uh, the one that people talk about the most, I think, is Thomason.net, right? Um, where you could go find some that hasn't been overly helpful in my opinion what has been the most helpful are two things number one you can google right and when you go through google one of my favorite things to do is go find all right probably like the biggest manufacturer in that space right and then what you can do is go to um like some of the like moz right the website tool moz and then it will show you like related websites Okay. And so you could pay for different subscriptions. There's a lot of different like tools like SEM rush and things like that, um, that you can pull up, find a, find a big manufacturer. Right. And then you could put that in there. And then all of a sudden what you'll notice is like similar sites. Google does a pretty good job of helping you identify like, Hey, consider these guys. Now it's not going to be foolproof. It's not like just, Oh wow, here's my full list. Like you got to sort through the weeds and all the junk, but that is how we found one of our first manufacturers was like, I think we were probably on like Google page 30 and also just putting in a bunch of different manufacturers and then putting in that, you know, putting them into Moz and SEM rush and just looking for related sites. And then we just went through. So it, it honestly is just kind of like a gold mining game where you're just like lots of Google research, lots of typing in different websites in there and just seeing what works. And then ultimately reaching out to them. It's not what you know, it's what you can find. All right. Isham asks, how do you check a product patent or trademark before selling? So I'll give a, a quick demo. So let me add mine to this stream here. So if you if you just type into Google right now, trademark lookup, click on the top result for the USPTO, that'll bring you here. Click on search our trademark database that goes to what's called TESS. And in here, click on basic word mark searches and that'll bring you here. So let's say... You wanted to see if Gap was a trademark. Obviously, something super short like this, you're going to be overwhelmed with the results like this. But if you said, uh, you know, Gap shoes uh, in house, you know, super long, and you type that in, you don't get a record hit. That's because there's not an exact match hit. Now, when when you engage a trademark lawyer, they're going to do some cursory searches to try and see if there's anything that might. Um, prevent that from going through and they'll give you some advice or they'll try and narrow it down. You can select your category, stuff like that. Um, but that's a pretty basic trademark demonstration. Um, I don't know anything about patents. However, uh, Josh, is there, do you have any knowledge on, on patent looking before you start selling? Yeah, so we actually have hundreds of patents pending currently. Um, they are design, design Jeez, patents. Please. So yes, I, I work with Rich Goldstein. Um, he's kind of my partner on on all the patent work. Um, when it comes to, and he was also on my podcast recently, and what he had talked about was, unless you're like, and what you're going to be mainly concerned about is going to be a utility patent, a design patent. Like, long story short, it is so hard for just kind of the regular everyday person like you or me to like try to go in and try to dissect like all the different utility patents that you might run up against with your new product or all of the design patents. But just know that those are two different like patents you need to be looking at. Like make sure you're not, you know, imitating somebody's design patent. And that's why we have hundreds of design patents is because as soon as somebody tries to imitate us on Amazon, we can immediately send them, you know, here's our patent it's number this. and, and Amazon takes it down. And guess what? It's different than the copyright. Um, this is kind of a whole other tangent. You can file a copyright infringement against somebody, right? And all somebody has to do is just claim, you know, they counter notice you, which basically says, nope, I don't believe that I'm violating your copyright. If you believe that that's true, sue me, right? And very rarely are people going to go pay the legal fees to go sue somebody. And so Amazon reinstates that. But if you file with Amazon, say somebody infringed my design patent, right? Like it's just, it's off like that. The person that has imitated you, uh, there's no recourse for them to plead their case with Amazon. Basically, Amazon says like, well, you could go fight this in court. And then if you get it cleared through court, 
then we can consider bringing it back on. So, so, so it's, this it's is a, a gigantic value add. Um, Josh just talked about onus. So when you're filing copyright, onus is on you. Yes, you can get them down temporarily. Sure, it's a pain in the ass. But the onus is on you to fight it. Versus yep. the patent, you've already taken some legal remedies, not even remedies, whatever the word for pre-remedy would be. Um, and you've procured protection, so to speak. So that's a that's a great thing. Um, I tried to I tried to launch like the uh, a Magnum Gulp one time. It was a wine glass you put on a, a wine bottle, but because somebody had a freaking design patent, that got me taken down. So I've been on the receiving end of this. <laughs> yes, uh, Noman wants to know: Can we ask questions regarding PPC today? So so we are trying to focus on product research, uh, sourcing, as well as product launching today. But if you got a you got a PPC question around the launch, we we definitely need to get to that today. Uh, Success of selling says great answer. Thank you guys. Ryan says, happened to us. Uh, they can target you for black hat tactics in other ways. Yes, we've seen that. Uh, does Amazon protect patent pending claims? No. So how long, like how long did until a patent goes through, Josh? Oh man. So we filed some of our patents back in the fall of 2021. Well, actually summer of 2021. So we're coming up on, you know, 18 months now we just had them get we probably had 30 of them get approved within the last month and then you know it they said it will be another month for them to like get on the official like registrar or whatever um so that it becomes legit and then we get the whole you know certificate in the mail and all that stuff so, so anywhere from like what i've heard with rich is like anywhere from 18 months all the way up to like 36 months like it's just kind of like time. you run the gamut yeah, it's it's a long haul, but that's so why you do the copyrights. Do the copyrights first. You have some protection, but then have the patent pending, and you can at least put patent pending in your copy. Off. Yep, and on your listing to kind of scare off people, so to speak. So today we're joined by Josh Hadley. He's an eight-figure seller on Amazon, and uh, he, he knows some stuff. I've learned a couple of big things today. Great tips so far. So if you're just joining us, make sure you hit the rewind button later on. Brandon asks, uh, selling in Canada, Mexico, any harm in switching this on? What are the pros and cons? Any particular milestones or other indicators that sellers should use to decide on this? Uh, so real quick on my side, NARF, uh, North American Remote Fulfillment Program, auto enables these days. For most categories, it's a no-brainer. We'll add anywhere from 2 to 3% of sales out of Canada. Um, physically shipping into Canada is probably worth it. Get about another 7% in sales. Uh, Mexico, not so much. Uh, product dependent on that. Josh, do you have any opinions on any of this? Yeah, we've we've opened up NARF. And uh, yeah, just like you said, maybe 2 to 3%. I, I think it's an easy, like, why not turn it on? Um, you know, one of the next things that we're considering is like shipping in directly to Amazon or in Canada based on the ones that we're seeing success with on NARF alone, right? And so now I don't have to worry about taking my 1300, you know, plus SKU catalog over to Amazon Canada and dealing with that headache. It's like, okay, let's, let's take the 20% that's driving most of that revenue from Canada. So that'd be my recommendation. If you have a large catalog is like, just focus on what's working, right? Don't, don't feel like you have to do it all at once. That, that, that should be the title of my business book. Focus on what's working. Uh, <laughs> Jeff says, preparing to launch a new supplement concerned about competitor making purchases and leaving several one-star NCX review impacts. How best to handle? I don't want Amazon to shut me down before I get started. So in the supplement space, many of those that have been burned many times by the black hat, Chinese cough, Chinese uh, people selling supplements and leaving one-star reviews, it is pretty cutthroat. Uh, this is a thing. This happens. Josh, any advice or opinions? Man, I I would have to say I'm not going to be very helpful on that um, because, yeah, I have heard of all of those black hat tactics. Fortunately, we play in a space where there aren't a lot of black hat tactics going on. Um, but I would recommend, I think Howard Ty is one that uh, he knows the opposite end of of all the black hat tactics and also how to combat some of those as well. So he's he is a resource I would point people towards. Good tip. Uh, fighting product reviews generally not worth the effort. 4% removal rates typically. Um, so you just have to you have to overwhelm the system with orders from my experience. Uh, all right. So what type of campaigns, what bids are you using when you launch a new product, Josh? Yeah, great question. So we have uh, done a little bit of everything over the last five years. 
But what we have settled on over the last kind of 18 months has been working very, very well for us. Okay. So one of the things that we do, and I will actually, hold on, let me share my screen over here. Let me know when I flip it back on. You're not seeing it right now? No, I do. I just didn't want to share it until you were ready. Okay. Yeah, you could go ahead and share it yep. right now. All right, add into the stream. So, all right. So we've got one of the most important things that we've done is when you do the keyword research, right? So this correlates with what I was talking about earlier. They're like, you can't just launch me two products. You have to understand the keywords and where they're coming from. I would argue this is this exact same thing for PPC. I think back in the day, you would hear a lot of people um, talk about how, oh, you need to create a bunch of auto campaigns. You need to create a bunch of, you know, broad campaigns and just to start off with and then start gold mining, you know, and seeing what keywords are working for you. It's like, no, like you can do all of the up what upfront work so that you launch with highly relevant super like shop related keywords for your product. And we have been crushing it with some of our newer products that we've launched. We've come out of the gates at 20% ACOS with brand new products. And we're getting like the with top no four reviews with no reviews. Yep. Okay. So, so, so Josh is saying what you typically don't hear from most Amazon sellers and experts who claim you should do some slow PPC setups and, and uh, migrate keywords over. Um, my my experience is the same as Josh's. I align with him, and that is go out of the gate, it's hitting strong. So uh, one one example I'll share uh, when I launched my mom box in 2020, 144 thousand dollars in 30 days, 11 thousand ad spend. And what's what's the killer here is that 5 thousand of that ad spend was on one keyword, gifts for mom. Yep. Right. And so like you got you got on the screen here planner stickers. Right. Yep. And and Josh is showing us some data uh, to show how that can lead to immediate results. So yep. uh, don't don't be afraid to test. I mean, I mean, a couple hundred dollars in ad spin on a, on a solid keyword that you've selected before you even launch the product. It, it can pay out. So, yep. so tell me more about your experience, Josh. Yep. So what we do is we do all of the upfront work to begin with. And there's a lot of great tools that you could use. I would give a give a shout out to. Brandon Young and, and data dive here because, you know, a lot of kind of this spreadsheet that you're looking at kind of came from some of the courses that I took from him. But, you know, we kind of worked in our own magic as well and kind of made this our own at the every, same time. Every business ever does the same thing. Yes. Yep. So here we are looking at the data, what we have done and just to kind of walk you through what has happened here. Okay. In this tab, we call it our S3 main tab. What we've done is my team has put in the best selling, you know, planner stickers, right? If that's the opportunity that we're specifically looking at, my team has gone in here. They have populated, you know, 15 to 20 of the best sellers. Okay. I have their sales and I've got their ASINs. And then this is all the data. Like when you run Cerebro, this is basically Cerebro, but manipulated to, uh, you know, make it the view that we want to look at, right? So I can see here the relevancy score, like of, you know, all of these competitors, how many of them are ranking on page one for stickers for planners, right? Planner sticker, right? Looks like almost everybody is, you know, getting ranked here for these first few. But the key is like, can you find gold right here in like the relevancy score of like five, six, five to four, right? Where people are actually overlooking either including those keywords in their listing or their product doesn't meet that need, right? But could you add in, especially if we're doing stickers, like, and there's just a bunch of stickers that come in, comes in this pack. For example, let's do, you know, TV planner stickers, right? Could I include, you know, TV related stickers in my, you know, set of a thousand different stickers that I'm going to be coming out with? Like, this starts to get very clear and gives you ideas of like, wow, if I want to drive multiple eyeballs to my listing, it all comes from the keywords, right? So when it comes to product development at the same time, we are looking intimately at all of these keywords, especially like I mentioned, look at the relevancy score of three, four, five, 
And all of a sudden I'm starting to see like, ooh, weight loss stickers. Okay. So if I'm going to come out with the planner stickers and there's going to be thousands of stickers, we should factor in. Maybe there's a page of those that are just specific to fitness and weight loss. And let's keep going down this list and see if there are any other, you know, fitness related keywords. So, uh, hey, look at this fitness stickers for planners and journals. Look at this. Only, you know, only four of these competitors are actually ranking on the first page for this, right? It's probably because their product doesn't serve that need, nor do they probably have those keywords in their listing. So I think like, I know I'm not, we're, we're still leading up to this whole PPC conversation, but this is like the fundamental basis when we are creating our products. It is focused on the keywords. We develop the product, not by looking at what our competitors are doing and saying like, oh, well, they're the best seller. So they must be doing everything right. So let's, let's exactly mimic what they're doing. It's funny because there is a big competitor in our space and all they do, they're an overseas competitor, as you would let, imagine. Let me guess, they just copy you. And all they do is just, they just copy you. If you have page one, their page one looks the exact same thing, right? Like there's no ingenuity in that. And their only way to win sales is by a race to the bottom, right? I'm, they have, I'm sure I'm sure you were super flattered by this. Oh, my heavens, right? Well, that's why we have design pants and it's my favorite thing when I get to uh, contact them. And uh, you so, know. so a couple of things I'll note, uh, note here. Uh, so column H, that relevancy score, this is what we do in uh, my Amazon guy, SEO phase zero. It's a common practice for most uh, sophisticated shops these days in doing their keyword research. And, and like Josh mentioned, uh, Brandon Young's, uh, tool does this. Um, and there are other tools that do, do it as well. So it's a very common practice to rank the keywords going ahead. So I really like your idea. So this really does answer a couple of questions for me. Um, you know, can you add in that that side niche item to, to nail that one keyword nobody's paying attention to? Yep, you can. You know, Noman wanted to know, should we target specific keywords at the beginning for PPC or can we go with a number of keywords? That also answers that question. Because here you can see it's both. Uh, and you can target which keywords are going to be more relevant or are more ignored and have an opportunity for some of those. So really great questions. Well, uh, and let me let me just layer on to that yeah, real quick there, um, Stephen, because when we come over here to our this is our focus keyword list. Right. So to begin with, I have my team just go through this list and they're just like, hey, is this relevant? Yes or no. Right. Like that's why you see no here. Um, daily planner stickers. I guess we decided that wasn't going to be relevant creative 360 planner stickers. This is like a brand, you know, so it's like, oh, we're not going to be trying to sell on this brand term, right? Like, let's not include that in our listing or worry about that. So anyways, we have just, all we do at the beginning is just like, is this a relevant term? Yes or no. What I think is kind of our special sauce, so to speak, that I don't think many people do this is that we go a step further, especially when it comes to PPC and as we prepare the product for launch. What we do is, all right, here's all of these, these keyword terms that we determined were you know, related to our product. We have them sorted here by the brand analytics ranking, okay? So we put all of these terms into brand analytics and we ask brand analytics, hey, what's the, what's the ranking, right? So this is, in terms of, you know, prioritized based on highest search volume to lowest. Then what we do here is we classify each keyword. My team goes through literally keyword by keyword. I know it's a, you know, tedious, meticulous process, but it, you have Vir to do virtual this. assistant franchisable event, though. Yep. You have to do this. This is why we've been so successful when we launch new products with PPC and other things. So. Basically, but I became just, a business seller to get passive income, Josh. I don't want to be spending my time in spreadsheets. <laughs> let's just say, let's let's also cut that myth, right? All of the uh, TikTok accounts that are saying like, create passive income by selling on Amazon. Uh, let's do it. Let's shut down that myth right now. E-commerce is not a passive business. If you just set it up and you're just like, well, I'm going to go hit the beach for the next month. Like, I'm sorry, but uh, if you're in my space... I, I'm glad you're my competitor because I'm going to crush you. <laughs> I'm going to crush you. Um, yes. So anyways, all right. Uh, I digress. Let's go back here. So I have four different types of keywords that we're classifying them as. Okay. I have shop. Then down here, you're going to run into semi-shop. 
Okay, then you have browse specific and then we have browse general keywords, all right? So what does this mean? So shop keywords, when I put this keyword into Amazon, what I want to see is are those competitors, let's put this here, are my competitors showing up all over the top of the page, right? And sure enough, right, you have to know what product idea you're going into, right? But here I can easily see like, hey, yep, all of the competitors that we had on that Cerebro, you know, uh, download, they're all showing up here. This to me, basically the criteria for my team that I've told them is I want to see five or more of our competitors that would be direct competitors with us when we launch this product ranked in, in either spaces one through 10 on page number one, Okay. They're taking up the top spots. 50% of those top 10 spots are my competitors. That means it's a highly relevant search term, right? When people are searching for that search term, you know they are actually purchasing from my competitors right now. So to me, I know that this is truly a shop keyword, all right? So then what is a semi-shop keyword, all right? Well, a semi-shop keyword would be, hey, there may be, maybe the five competitors aren't showing up on the first one through 10, but they're still on page one and they're kind of sprinkled throughout, right? So, hey, as I look at it, basically my criteria for a semi-shop keyword is approximately half of the listings on page one would be my direct competitors, okay? Um, and the reason why you'd see that, like fitness stickers, why is that a semi-shop? <clears throat> well, with, with fitness stickers, it's more of a niche term, right? So for fitness stickers, sometimes people aren't looking and let's pull this up just as an example, because I love showing people how it actually works instead of talking about hypotheticals here. So with we, we give you the bumper sticker and then we get into the weeds to show you how it applies. One of my favorite business right. books is The Road Less Stupid. That guy does a really good job. So if you guys are looking for a business book, pick that one up. I, I think anybody benefits from that one. All right, keep going. All right. So Obviously, what we were looking at to begin with were just kind of like the initial product idea was like, hey, can we come out with like just a book of like a thousand different stickers that's very broad? Okay. So, what I'm seeing here, the reason why we classified this as like a semi shop keyword is because look at these. Most of these are like only fitness or health wellness stickers that are showing up here in the top five spaces, right? Here's the more results workout stickers, gym stickers, right? Like these are very like fitness, workout, inspirational um, sayings. Whereas you get down here and you're going to start seeing more of the generic stickers again, right? So this is kind of like fairly generic. All right. Hey, look at this. This is fitness and workout productivity. Okay. Take a look at this one. All right. Self-care recreation, right? Like this isn't necessarily workout or fitness related. So like, that's where we can see like, all right, these are kind of random. Um, so you, you can just kind of get a feel, right? Like you have to just search for that search term on Amazon, right? And so we decided like, hey, if you look at this, like this is kind of the idea that we were looking for, right? So we have over a thousand different stickers, okay? They could be used in various ways, planners, calendars, whatever. Okay. And if I zoom in here, like you can see like, okay, maybe some of these stickers are fitness oriented. That's well and good. And so we felt like my team felt like there's a number of these kind of competitors that are showing up for the specific search term fitness stickers. So it's not a high shop keyword, like the search intent when people search fitness stickers, they're not super looking for, you know, this, you know, big set of 1800 seems like they're more looking for like, hey, I, I need 100 and I want them very specific to gym and fitness. But there is a good shot that we should be getting ranked for that. So that's basically what you're doing. And then as we move further down the list, you have browse specific. Browse specific is like maybe you only see a handful. Maybe it's like one, two, three, four of your competitors showing up on all of page one. Okay. And then your browse general keyword, this is this is definitely probably going to be more of like your super broad keywords. Um, yeah, like this bullet journal supplies, right? 
wow, there's a lot of different supplies for journals, right? Could be pens, it could be tabs, could be stickers. There could be a lot of things. The reason why we classify as a browse general is it means that, hey, maybe one or two of those competitors have showed up on that first page, but this is a long shot, right? Like they were lucky enough to get ranked here, but let's not make this a, let's not make that our hinge point in terms of the success of this product. As it matures, sure, we could focus on these browse general keywords, but to begin with, you want to go with the super high relevant, sometimes they're most often like the long tail keywords, um, but that's where you start. And then the way, you know, here's, we kind of wrap things up here with the actual answer that we've been leading up to. How do we set up our PPC campaigns? We do single keyword campaigns exact match for each of these shop keywords. That's it. That's our strategy to begin with. And we go out with just the shop keywords, period. And we go from there. Shop keywords, single keyword campaigns, exact match. That that isn't that is the strategy of the entire PPC setup of an eight million dollar seller from Josh Hadley. So that that that's that's some juice dropping down. Uh, I just texted Brandon Young that we're uh, dropping data dive <laughs> tools on on uh, the podcast today. So we'll probably add a link to that. But if you guys want to check that out, uh, data dive tools is is the tool. Uh, we're all pretty friendly in the space. We like we like Brandon Young. Uh, all right, so here is where we're going to do um, the part of the podcast where we have too many questions we can't get to, and we're going to try and do like 60 seconds a piece. So good luck with this, Josh. All uh, right. Well, as fast as you can, we're going to go through these. Okay. Gavin says, best to learn macros in Excel to fully optimize these sheets, although you can download basic ones from Data Dive, Adam Heiss. It will cost you through, though. Brian says, thanks for the nuggets, Josh. You're very welcome there. Check says, rebranding my product. Can I update the designs as well to keep the ASIN rank reviews? I would I would recommend that strategy personally. What about you, Josh? Yep, add it as a variation for sure. Dante says, do you build that Excel sheet or is that the software? So so data dive and, and the Adam High stuff, those are the places that you can pick that up. Uh, Residence TV says, TTV says, when someone purchases the full listing optimization package with MAG, how does this process compare? I have a product launch in progress. Um, so, uh, Josh, do you, do you sell product uh, optimization launches as well? We do not. Okay. Nope. I am, All right. So I just want to make I sure I asked that before I plug myself here. Um, yeah. So for those that do want to hire and get some some assistance, uh, you can go over to myamazonguy.com, click on the services drop down. Um, we do have some a la carte services in addition to full service, if you guys want to check that out. Um, and in here, uh, whether you just want A-plus content or you want the full image stack and everything in between, uh, we do have that available for full purchase over at myamazonguy.com. So you guys can check that out. Um, and uh, we're always here to support those that are trying to do their listing launch. But that's going to include title, bullets, images, A-plus content, all those sort of things. Uh, so check that out. Brian says, passive income only. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Coming from Nebron. Uh, all right. So we got a few other questions we haven't got to yet. Uh, Jake says, Steve, speaking of trademarks, how do you how do you use Starbucks? Would it be considered a parody? Uh, great question, Jake. Uh, so sometimes if you use terms, uh, certain properties enforce them a little bit more than others. Netflix, for example, and Stranger Things has somebody policing that on the daily. And I know this because all of my Netflix tumblers went down. Other terms, however, have not been policed. And I would argue it's parody 100%. But Amazon will still be a pester and it'll still go up and down, left and right. So it's just kind of a question of what you want to focus on. Um, Dominic says, what are you using pricing strategies for new launches? All right. So over to you, Josh. 60 second answer. Yeah. First, we go with a relatively low price. We go towards like, the bottom 25% of, you know, kind of the prices that we see on there just to make sure like, hey, price is not going to be the objection to begin with. But then what ends up happening six months to a year down the road, our prices most often are double what kind of the average is on there. And we've had success with it. Uh, I'm late. Need to go back and watch everything I missed. Yes, you do. We did cover patents that you asked about. So we got some good process on that. Uh, Wish says we have a utility patent and Amazon helps us take down copycats. It's very helpful. Uh, Noman off LinkedIn says, if bids are high, should we focus on long tail keywords? I think the single keyword answer applies here. Yes. 
Oh yeah, hundred percent. If you're just using the shop keywords, even if you have an expensive um, keyword, like you know that that's where traffic's coming from. Why why run away from it? Do you find in your experience, uh, even if you don't generate orders, that it helps you rank for those keywords? Yeah, one hundred percent. Especially if you know this goes into listing optimization. We make sure all of those shop keywords are in our listing in exact match form, right? If you look at those specific phrases, you will find them, whether it be in the title or in the bullets or the description or even back in search terms, in the exact phrase that you were, you saw on that spreadsheet. Coming up tomorrow, I'm doing my Ask Me Anything on camera live with Amazon sellers. So Noman asks, can we speak for one minute on camera? Yes, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, so tomorrow, we just released the StreamYard link for that for that tomorrow. So we can only have 10 guests at a time. I have instructions and all that sent in our email. If you guys want to subscribe to that, so you guys know when those are coming out, just go to myamazonguy.com slash subscribe to enter into our newsletter. Uh, we'll send you helpful information, tips, and podcast announcements like we did for today. Uh, so if you guys want to ask questions on camera, great thing to do there. We'll see you tomorrow at noon Eastern Standard Time right here, same place, youtube.com slash myamazonguy. Got time for a few more sneaky questions in here. Let's see what else we got. Naveen says, why not review category bestseller pages for product planning? That's actually a good question. Yeah, you can do that. That's one of the, you know, I had seven seven other hacks that we could go through. That is one of them. Um, and yeah, you could certainly go through. I, one of my other favorites is go through the bestsellers of the category, right? They'll always give you like the one through a hundred of here's the bestsellers in, you know, planners or notebooks right so yeah that's a way you could go and generate a lot of ideas so we've used that in the past we just didn't have time to get to it all there's so much good stuff so so brandon says appreciate the shout out guys this is the the guy we were talking about the tool i, I sent him a whatsapp so he's he's actually going to see us down uh in orlando he says josh so he looks forward to seeing you there um i'll be seeing uh brandon at a retreat this weekend in fact so it's going to be nice to shake hands there uh, all right, so we got questions about Vine program and reviews. Is Daniels asks, is the Vine program worth it when launching? I say no. What do you say, Josh? I have never used Vine, but my initial uh, answer would be no as well from the horror stories that I've heard from other people and just the lack of success so, they have with it. So the data that I read says an average Vine review is 4.1 and an average regular review is 4.3. So do you want to take the risk at not no. being a four and a half star product? That's the question. Uh, Ravzen, thanks for joining uh, the YouTube channel. I probably butchered your name, but thank you for becoming the latest member of the My Amazon Guy podcast. We appreciate that. Uh, Gavin says, you don't need to pay money until you receive the first review. Uh, he's talking about Vine. That's true. Uh, but it can, it can, you know, it, it's the question. You don't know it's not what review you're getting. Yeah, it's not necessarily a cost question, although there is a cost. It's like, what review are you going to get? If you're selling a supplement, I highly recommend never touching Vine. For example, A, they have no idea if the supplement works because nobody knows if supplements work. <laughs> and even if they did work, which they do, but we don't know if they do. But even if they did, they don't work in 24 hours. So you can't exactly get a good review on a supplement. So it's just, I just don't recommend it. Um, unless you have a cheaper way of consistently getting better reviews, another good way to get legitimate feedback out the gate. So he, he is a Gavin, I believe is a proponent of, of vine there. Uh, and that's good. He also says best way to learn macros in Excel, fully optimize these sheets. Although you can download the basic ones from data dive, Adam Heiss, all that good stuff. All right. So I think we've caught up Brian, also our newest member of the YouTube channel. If you guys want to join the channel, we do prioritize member questions. Uh, just slam that join button over at youtube.com slash my Amazon guy. Uh, Dante says, thank you, Josh, for all your tips. It's going to really help with his product launch this month. Wish says, Josh, I'd love to screenshot, but it's too blurry. So so Josh purposely blurred that out. He was just trying to show one example. So so Wish, all you got to do is just go over to your brand analytics drop down at Seller Central uh, and check that out yourself. You can see some of the some of the options that Josh was talking about in theory. All right, so those those are all the questions we're going to take today. So if anybody wants to get in touch with Josh Hadley, successful $8 million seller, how would they want to do that? And do you want them to do that? Yeah, of course. So I do have a podcast and 
I had you on the podcast recently, Stephen, as well. It was fantastic. I had such a great time that I decided to invite Josh to my podcast. Hey, so I, I felt honored. Um, so yeah, it's Ecom Breakthrough. So Ecom with two M's. Sharing it here on the screen right now. This is the website. You could go here and, and check out some of our um, latest people that we've had. But we've had Kevin King on the podcast. We've had Steve Simonson on the podcast. We've had Stephen Pope. Uh, Brandon Young will be a guest in the future. So we've got some really like high level sellers. And you can see that it's what it's meant for is to help other established brands go to eight figures and beyond. So the tactics that I'm sharing is just like you've heard today. We're getting into the weeds and we're sharing like stuff that you can implement in your business today. And I leave each podcast episode with three kind of like takeaways. And I say, hey, based on what you listen today to today, here are three takeaways that you could implement in your business today to help you scale and grow to those eight figures and beyond. So lots of strategies um, that I share there. So best way would be reaching out there. And then I also do a monthly giveaway where I do a, a comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. And I do that for one kind of lucky winner, so to speak. And so to enter to win that, all you have to do is just email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com. And then in that subject line, just say strategy audit and kind of plead your case as to why I should choose you uh, to do that strategy audit with. So that's what I have for your listeners. Again, I don't have any other uh, you know, I don't have an agency. There's no, you know, you can't pay me to, uh, you know, build out your listings or anything for that. So I'm just trying to share uh, content. Uh, you know, I've been the recipient of listening to a lot of great content and now I just feel like it's, it's time to give back and share that with other people and share a lot of the mistakes that I made. And I think secretly, this is me like recording and documenting this journey for my own children that if they want to get into e-commerce, it's like, Here's the mistakes to avoid. Here are the things to do. And, you know, maybe one day I package it up in a book and could give it to them. I so that's that's my selfish intentions with all of this, I guess. I figure my kids are going to turn me into a robot with AI and then just like recreate me for my YouTube <laughs> nether region. So, you know, so that's what I'm expecting to happen. You know, uh, I remember the old grandpa. He's talking about the Amazon again. <laughs> right? Like if Amazon even exists in 50 years at this rate, it probably won't because of the yeah. amount of treachery corruption and seller support sucking so bad and restock limits and all those things oh yeah topics for another time though josh thanks for coming on the podcast again everybody check me out tomorrow thursday noon eastern standard time and every week thursday noons come and ask me a question on camera and uh, brian was one of our guests last week he was a fantastic interview he's watching again today you can see he just joined the channel there and uh, he showed us some of his products. We dove straight in. You can see the look on his face. It was amazing. So I hope you guys check that out. And uh, that's our episode today. We'll see you guys later.